good afternoon everybody on behalf of uh, dr ramesh murthy he has not been able to make it uh, because he has uh, met with a small accident nothing uh, nothing uh, uh, untoward but uh, small he has then uh, requested for the ic to continue he has forwarded the presentation i will uh, request all the panelists dr das sir dr uh, uh, shalu madam and uh, mathur sir to please join on the dais sir please So I think our first speaker is Dr. Ramesh. He already downloaded everything. So <clears throat> please. NLDO. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. As uh, I have uh, said, I will be uh, presenting on behalf of uh, Dr. Ramesh Murthy. Uh, a topic of uh, uh, the presentation uh, we will start for the uh, congenital anomalies will be with the congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Though uh, seems to be a trivial topic, it is of great importance. We do get so many patients in OPD which have been uh, children brought by the parents, buried parents with a history of watering discharge from the eyes. Um, uh, uh, they, they many things it's a prelude to some uh, disease whether it is uh, going to affect their vision or not. Uh, uh, right diagnosis and right line of management of such patients is paramount importance and uh, uh, management of such patients re uh, re uh, require not only uh, taking uh, parents into confidence but also to have a clear guidelines and when to uh, how when uh, when to do the conservative management or when to operate so congenital uh, if you see the uh, and uh, developmental uh, size that there is a as the uh, congenital dacrocystitis or nasolacrimal obstruction occurs due to failure of canalization of the NLD. Commonest site is the inferior wall of Hasner. Uh, many times, even the full term babies, uh, there may be 30 percent people who uh, uh, are brought with the history of watering and the symptomatic block where there is a discharge or regurgitation or even a purulent fluid is in, in the 2 to 6 percent people. Clinically, such cases uh, are presented with watering discharge because of the uh, stagnation of water, there is a continuous uh, stagnation, there is an infection and chronic conjunctivitis can occur. Uh, even uh, the small, uh, that can lead to matting of eyelashes and many pa uh, parents uh, complain that when they try to clean the eyes, there is a purulent discharge that is because of the regurgitation when you give pressure over the sac. What is the role of management? First, you have to be sure of the diagnosis. See, uh, uh, when you have to uh, differentiate between the watering, which is of congenital NLDO or some other disease like a cornea or bipthalmus, you need to check what, what is the corneal diameter, what is the corneal luster, what is the vision as per the age. And uh, when the other things are ruled out and when you are saying it's a nasolacrimal duct obstruction, uh, what is the gravity, how much is the discharge or regurgitation is there has to be seen. Uh, conservative management is the uh, uh, first line of management 
is unless until there is a amniocele or a, a mucopurulent uh, infection or which has caused the cellulitis. So uh, you have to go for the Kegler's massage or the sac massage over the uh, uh, lacrimal sac area. And along with that, you give the topical antibiotics. Topical antibiotics can be given as a broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, generally, uh, uh, those are uh, easy on cornea like tobramycin is selected or you can go for the uh, swab from the sac regurgitation and go for the culture and sensitivity. Uh, you have to teach the parents, especially mother, how to do the massage. It is not giving the pressure over the nose or uh, just not uh, trying to give some massage over the eye, but uh, try to go from the medial side blocking the uh, uh, punctal opening, uh, giving the firm pressure over the medially and downwards. Uh, it has to be taught to the mother. If, uh, we generally or I generally tell the mother to palpate their own medial canthal region and feel for the depression of the lacrimal sac area. That depression has to be where, uh, in, in the is the region where they have to give the massage to the babies. Many parents, especially mothers, are hesitant to touch the eye, giving the forceful massage in that area or even they uh, uh, feel that when the baby starts crying, they give up or they don't try to uh, 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 give the forceful pressure so that the baby don't cry. So uh, teaching them and or in the OPD basis in the our uh, uh, consultant consultant room, tell parent to show how they are doing the massage. So when you have you can correct them, you can show them small video film and tell them to give it, do it ten strokes every time and four times a day. So that is why the conservative management is the first line because. As uh, uh, there are few, there's uh, sorry, I read that uh, uh, commonest organism is H influenza, and there was study in South India which stored the Streptococcus pneumonia as the commonest organism. So why do we go for the conservative management as the first line of management? Because if you see the uh, timeline or the natural course of the congenital nasolacrimal obstruction as a whole, most of the patients do recanalize in first six to eight months with the help of massage that with the hydrostatic pressure which is going down with the uh, recanalization of wall of fastener do uh, take place and the patient do get symptom symptom free the uh, when the uh, natural course says that most of the patients uh, will uh, will cure with this uh, massage or over a course of time you have to be patient in dealing so uh, what is the ideal time to uh, go in. Where, where is the added time to uh, get the patient under uh, anesthesia is about 9 to 12 months. At, if the patient who has not improved by 6 months of proper Kegler massage, uh, the uh, symptoms do continue, then uh, you need to check where is the blockage is and can you open the block. So this is the best time is to go at around 1 year of age. So success is uh, as the child incre the age increases more, if uh, then the chances of success declines with age. The simple obstruction and complex obstruction uh, both need to be uh, dealt at around one years of age. What will happen if the child comes to in OPD, which is about three to four years of age? Parents have brought okay, he is now four years or three years. There is a history suggestive of NLDO for since birth. Massage was given or probably was not given and they have lost to follow up. Now they have come for the first time at the age of three to four years. Again, the first line of treatment is to go for the probing. Though the chances of success of probing do reduce after the age of one year, but the child who has represented for the first time in OPD has not been uh, uh, probed earlier. Even after age of three or four years, the probing is the uh, first line of management in such cases. So uh, there is, uh, uh, when you can go for early, as I had just mentioned, if there is a amniocele or there is a repeated uh, episodes of acute dacrocystitis in children or uh, extreme, uh, extremely symptomatic child, then you can go for the early probing. Otherwise, best time is to go for around 9 to 12 months of age. You need to have uh, a woman's probe set starting from uh, 4 0 to normal. So we start with the thinnest one. The uh, uh, natal ship punctum dilator, decongestion nasal spray, and give, getting the patient under uh, uh, sedation is what required. 
so it it is generally done in the office of uh, under transient anesthesia or it can be done in the ot with a mild sedation the uh, keeping the patient in the under ga with a uh, uh, complete uh, uh, tubing is generally not done even if the ga is to be given our uh, anesthetic generally gives, gives the i gel uh, anesthesia with that with the tube with uh, dilate the uh, uh, punctum do the probing uh, start with the upper uh, as, as shown in the upper punctum because the lower punctum which is the uh, uh, prominent drainage should, should not be damaged so you start with the upper try to go direction should be downwards uh, uh, medially and backwards uh, so that it enters into you you do feel the firm firmness when it enters the uh, bony part of the laser cremate duct uh, feel when where you can feel the uh, obstruction try to open the clear open uh, uh, at the end of it, you can uh, push the uh, fluid to check the patency. Uh, as uh, uh, what else can be done to check whether your uh, direction of the probe is uh, properly uh, directed or not? Uh, position of the patient is most important. Uh, uh, continue the uh, probing, and at the end of it, you can uh, use the nasal endoscope to see whether you can see the probe. Uh, or you can uh, see the metal to metal contact. So, if you are uh, sure that you have entered into the nasal cavity and not from the false passage. Uh, it will be difficult uh, uh, if the blo blockage is at the proximal site, then there can be a uh, difficulty in probing and doing the uh, dilatation. Under such, the uh, under observation of uh, uh, endoscope, it is uh, advisable to do it. If you have to go for the probing which is for the second or third time again uh, endoscopic guidance is what uh, will be helpful. Uh, with the, if the patient has after uh, you, you feel that you have done the probing which is actually good on table there was the opening was uh, 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 achieved when you uh, flush the fluid you failed or you, even you aspirated the fluid from the uh, nasopharynx but if it fails, then you can go for the repeat probing after two to three months. If the child is slightly older, then the, along with the probing or the repeat probing, you can go for the uh, stenting in uh, older people where the intubation can be done. DCR in the children uh, can be uh, uh, done in, if the child is slightly uh, older, about four to five, and he has uh, shown the uh, repeated uh, probing was done, but it has failed. So as uh, said, the repeat probing anytime after uh, uh, four to six weeks, and if the symptom persist. So what is the effectiveness? First year, there is a definitely it gives 92% uh, resolution, and that is the time when you have to should go in. But even if, as the chart suggests, even if the patient uh, uh, comes to your OPD at the age of three or four years, at the primary patient not has been touched uh, earlier, probing is the first line of management in such cases. Uh, it can be added or it can be uh, augmented with in, uh, infracture of inferior turbinate or uh, intubation as I said with the uh, uh, silicon tube or a Crawford tube can be used where it is easy to remove from the nose. Uh, Pitatic DCR as uh, it is said if it is a failed stenting and uh, it is a bony obstruction then pediatric DCR usually perform after three years. It is not generally done before three to four years. We generally do at around four to five years only. As uh, said, there are few steps in the uh, pediatric DCR where the steps are absolutely the same as we do in the uh, uh, adult DCR. But in, in such cases, the uh, intubation is uh, helpful to maintain the patency. Endoscopy can be done to uh, if there is a, a difficulty in uh, intubation or the uh, passage or the space to operate is less in children then the intubation can be uh, endoscopy can be helpful in achieving the proper intubation endoscopic procedures i will just uh, pass through it and as a conclusion successful management depends upon the actual proper diagnosis proper management as well as uh, uh, following the protocol where the uh, uh, massage uh, that is regular massage is the first line of treatment even uh, probing at the age of say, nine months to uh, twelve months, and even the even if the patient comes at the later stage, uh, probing should be attempted first, 
and repeat probing if it is to be done then silicon intubation and uh, if the dcr is to be done then pediatric dcr at the age of uh, after 3 years preferably at 4 to 5 years and with intubation to be done thank you there's a small video uh, by uh, dr murthy showing his uh, technique of uh, probing in a ch children as you guys in under short anesthesia where the upper canaliculus is the first uh, uh, after dilatation syringing is done that you can see the regurgitation probing and once you follow the proper direction you feel that tug this is the tug where it just went in and then you uh, what is called as reaming you move it it is called as reaming it uh, then uh, gives the dilates the lower end so uh, I, I, once you have uh, feel that uh, uh, proper uh, dilatation has been uh, achieved you can put the fluid and aspirate from the nose thank you to start but uh, one very important take home message for in case of a congenital nldo timing of the treatment and proper technique and though in book it is mentioned is a regular method everyone takes a regular but practically uh, lots of us our doctors also doing some wrong technique that's the reason is fail so you explain in proper way to uh, 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 the parents so there should be a positive pressure inside to create the positive pressure the mandatory thing is that both the punctum should be occluded by one side of your index finger the parents index finger then only sometime in one stroke there is a pop sound i just experienced with lots of kid suffering from epiphora treated everywhere just a press in proper technique one stroke enough if it is a membrane obstruction distended check with membrane of obstruction it is a very very one stroke that is the term is a pop sound just i request madam to say some tips if you want <laughs> yeah. that's the wrong technique most of the yeah and there's a no role of antibiotic that's most of the time i explain to my parents so that drop is to avoid further infection from your hand or finger clear there is a no role of any antibiotic no role of any systemic until unless any infection no role of course it may reduce the bacterial growth if there is a purulent distress otherwise the on the treatment is a no such role only the muscles and that might also by a positive pressure it should be a positive pressure that is mandatory if you have any query then you can ask we can try ma'am is there so you can try to okay, something otherwise because please slides slides please audio visual team um, because good afternoon everyone and uh, thank you dr jain thank you dr nitin so here i will be talking about controversies and some advances in the management of congenital ptosis no, uh, at the outset i would like to disclose i don't have any financial disclosure with any of the products shown so congenital ptosis uh, comes with a certain set of common features which are which by which you can easily identify the nature of the ptosis in a child so basically it will be moderate to severe ptosis and uh, the child will be having a poor or fair liver traction there will be increased lid lag on down gaze on the affected side and there will be absent or a weak eyelid crease this is the typical uh, congenital ptosis i am not going into the many uh, the rare type of types of or rare variants of congenital ptosis but the classical congenital ptosis will show you all these uh, findings and our goals of treatment when we are treating a child with congenital ptosis are either to prevent or manage amblyopia and second are cosmesis so ptosis is one area where there is still uh, lots of options but none of them would be perfect I would say at the moment. And there are many grey zones, there are many debatable areas. Uh, 
And many questions also come to our mind when we think of managing a child with ptosis. It's not as simple as it sounds or as it is mentioned. When we read textbooks, we, we look at two, three options and then we, we go ahead and start treating ptosis. It's not that simple. There are so many ifs and buts which come to our mind if we are serious about practicing ptosis management. So first thing is timing of surgery in congenital ptosis, which is the best time to operate on congenital ptosis. So we'll try to answer some of these questions in the, the following few slides. And uh, whether unilateral versus bilateral surgery is good for congenital ptosis patients, which is the best material for a sling surgery. And uh, if the bells is poor, can you do ptosis surgery or should you not be touching those patients? And in Marcus Gunn jaw winking, whether it is imperative to excise the levator as mentioned in textbooks or one can do something else. And uh, if we do levator resection, there are lots of re uh, readjustments sometimes required. So how can we minimize? So lots of questions they come to my uh, come to our mind so let us take them few of them one by one now you have three cases so would you agree that uh, you know you can you you should be treating them or doing going in for surgery at presentation for all of these patients or is there any uh, particular situation where you would like to defer your surgery or all of them at presentation when the child comes is an indication for surgery. Yeah, so as Raghuraj rightly said, the one on the extreme right is having a very mild ptosis. It's a child again having a congenital ptosis, but very mild ptosis. The pupil is well exposed, no amblyopia will be there. So you don't really need to be very aggressive in surgery for these kids, and you can just wait and see how the parents feel. Let the child grow up a little bit, and if it's only for pure cosmesis, then you may do the surgery at a later stage, even after 12, 13, 14 years of age also, without any issues. So, but if there is pupillary occlusion or chin chin elevation or frontalis overaction, all those are signs where you need to intervene at an early stage. The minimum age that we usually uh, intervene is one year of age, but uh, uh, it all depends on how much, how severe the ptosis is. If the patient presents with a severe ptosis, you do surgery as soon as possible, counsel the parents accordingly. Usually by one year of age, there is good amount of, uh, uh, of uh, what do you say, neck support, neck, uh, neck support is there in the child and you will see more effects of the amblyopia causing effects of a totic lid. And also by one year of age, usually the uh, child is fit for general anesthesia as well and the chances of risk with anesthesia are less, so that would be the best time to operate. Otherwise, you can defer the surgery till even 13, 14 if it's a pure cosmetic surgery. Then which is the best material for sling surgery? So various materials have been described in literature, lots of sutures, lots of threads, facial atta has been uh, described as the gold standard in almost all the textbooks and uh, literature that you see, which is fine. Facial atta is a very good uh, technique, extremely good technique and very reliable, very long-lasting results you will get with facial atta. But the problem is that harvesting the facial atta is not everybody's cup of tea. You have to go to the thigh region. We are ophthalmologists. We are usually trained to focus on this particular area and then asking somebody to go on the thigh. It requires a certain bit of different amount of training and a different learning curve to harvest the facial atta from the thigh. Uh, those who do it frequently do it very well. But if you don't do it or you don't have the know-how to do it, it's certainly not a uh, problem. There are other means. So, in, in particular, in very small children, you will not get a very large amount of facial atta also. So, that may be an issue sometimes and you will also be creating a, another leg scar. So, of last for the last many years now, we have completely shifted to silicon uh, rods, which comes as a, a preformed uh, wire kind of a thing and uh, which has got two metallic needles on either side. And they are very easily available, not very expensive. The material can be left in the body for a long, long time without any problem. And it also has a little bit of elasticity, which we'll see later how it becomes useful. And there's always an ease of adjustment and removal. Suppose the surgery has not gone well, your contour is not very well, or the child grows up, there is a recurrence of ptosis. You can easily take it out, put it again. So very easily you can modify or do the resurgery and no need of any other bodily incisions as well. Uh, this is a video of the technique. Uh, do we have time? Okay, let's just quickly. So, we, uh, what the technique that I use is a Fox Pentagon technique in which we give three incisions on the forehead 
one center and two above the eyebrows and then the needle is passed through engaging the frontalis muscle in the forehead and then taken out into the eyelid deep to the orbital septum and then two incisions are there in the eyelid from which this the this needle is passed and then taken out on the other side to complete the pentagon just above the eyebrow now you can see the needle is taken out and then passing through the frontalis again in the forehead to come out through the uh, central midline forehead incision that you have given and once you have both the ends out you can there is a sleeve which comes with the uh, material yes, in, in the packing itself so you pass the sleeve on both the ends you tighten the the ends of the uh, of the silicon wire as much as you want look at the child under ga if the eyelid height is sufficiently achieved there you stop it you just fix the sleeve and sling with some suture Sixoprolin is what we use to tie around the sleeve and that completes your surgery. So simple technique, not very complicated and the results are really good. Yeah, sometimes there can be a recurrence after some time, but you can just, you just have to open the middle forehead incision, small procedure, tighten it up, lift it up further up as and when required when the child grows up. So that's also not a major issue. There's a bilateral congenital ptosis, another child with bilateral congenital ptosis. Another child with unilateral congenital ptosis. So earlier traditional teaching was to go for a bilateral sling surgery even in unilateral ptosis cases. But we've been operating unilaterally for many, many years now. The parents are also more comfortable just getting the surgery done on the affected side. And they don't want the normal side to be touched. So that's fine. And most children do well. You just have to counsel them about the increased lid lag on the side that you've operated. And that is all. So... Now, moving on to situation where there's a poor bells, whether you want to touch them or not. Again, it all depends on your uh, comfort level and the patient's comfort level. You have to really talk to them in detail. If the patient is really, really motivated and wants something done for the situation, then you may give them an option like this particular young guy had congenital fibrosis syndrome and uh, there was absolutely zero bells, but he was really motivated and he was one person who would would, who was really after me to get it operated and wanted seriously something to be done about it. So in such a situation, again, uh, a silicone sling helps because it has got some elasticity. So even if the bells is poor, you do get some amount of coverage and uh, 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 the patient was doing well. Uh, I've been following this patient up for a long time. Uh, he's been maintaining on topical lubricants and is happy. Again, a similar situation, congenital third nerve palsy, where there is total ptosis, complete ptosis. So, in this case, uh, the squint surgeon did the periosteal fixation of the medial rectus. And uh, we used a silicone rod for the elasticity that it gives us to lift up the eyelid. And moving on to the next uh, query is that how we can reduce the resurgeries in levatory section. So, many a times we perform levatory section under general anesthesia. Child is sleeping, we do use some sort of a beard rule or a... Uh, Berkey's rule but still the results are not exactly as per our expectation and then we have to go back again and and redo the surgery so one option is to use what is called as a adjustable suture technique in which the ends of the proline sutures which are passed from the tarsal plate to the levator muscle are left long hanging on the forehead and stuck to the forehead for about a week or so you assess the patient and adjustment is done sitting in the OPD itself you don't need to take the patient to the OT and uh, that comes useful uh, in young patients or patients who are very cooperative only. And in mild doses, uh, if uh, you have a positive phenylephrine test or and uh, sometimes even with the, you performed a levatory section but still there is some little bit of residue left, there is another option is mullerectomy. So, the, uh, I'll skip the video. So, you go from the conjunctival side and uh, take out a little bit of excise a little bit of the Muller's muscle and conjunctiva. You know, this works well for very mild doses. Now, this is a situation where often we are in doubt whether to operate or not to operate and what technique to use. So, in such cases, instead of going for levator resection, where you may often need a resurgery, Mullerectomy gives you a better option if you if your phenylephrine test is positive. Another patient who underwent Mullerectomy. Uh, just coming to the close, uh, Marcus Gunn jaw winking phenomena is another common entity that we see in our OPDs and uh, the textbooks mention that you have to extirpate the levator muscle completely to eliminate the jaw winking. But uh, uh, Dr. Seema, we had here, she's not here right now, but she did conduct a study in uh, her uh, center 
where she showed that even if we do a simple sling surgery without extubating the levator muscle that also gives us reasonably good results i actually i personally have been following this up for last many years now and the results are reasonably good so you can see in this particular example as uh, one case study that uh, there is ptosis with the uh, marcus gun jaw winking phenomena when the child is moving the jaw but uh, with sling surgery only you see that when the sling is done post surgery the amount of excursion of the eyelid on uh, movement of the jaw is significantly reduced and that is what we want to achieve so these are cosmetic surgeries and if we, because once you remove the levator completely there is no option of going back the lid becomes completely totic and sort of paralyzed this gives us a better contour of the eyelid as well the shape is maintained in a better way i would say last controversy or rather confusion is whether to go for a single stage or a two stage surgery in blepharophimosis traditionally we were taught to go for first canthoplasty and then go for a sling surgery but now um, again uh, there is no serious logic to wait for a long time and between the two surgeries and one can combine both the surgeries as a single stage uh, i particularly use cu plasty with sling surgery for such cases and that uh, can be done in the same sitting itself reducing the patient's uh, number of anesthesias which are required and the recovery time and these are a few examples of uh, the same stage uh, blepharophimosis surgery thank you very much uh, just to conclude that ptosis uh, gives you a lot of options so you have to weigh between your skills and your patient's expectations and talk to the family uh, in detail about all the outcomes and the risks associated with whatever technique you are using so just know what the patient expects otherwise uh, it's since it's uh, one of the cosmetic surgeries if there's a mismatch between what you are aiming to deliver and what the patient expects there can be problems so all these things are just to have a better understanding of the process that you're going to follow thank you very much Thank you sir And the other thing is the single stage uh, procedure. Single stage procedure does well, but if you have a very severe tosis in the sense that uh, your palpebral fissure width opening is less than two millimeter, then what happens is you're pulling one is in this direction, one is in that direction. The vector, it somehow the vector falls in between. So your, you know, the your tosis correction somehow doesn't come out that well. If you, that is what my experience is. If you do it in two stages, we say this when you do it in one stage. Yeah, that's severe. Yeah, moderate, uh, uh, moderate you can go ahead and do in single stage. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I don't think anybody has tried recently transnasal. I don't think anybody is trying it in recent time, recent See, uh, last it's few a very years. Traumatic procedure. In last few years, I don't think anybody has tried. Hmm. Can, we, there are multiple, you know, you can just screw in and you can make two uh, make two holes and you pass the, you know, wire like this and do it. So there's no need. So again, uh, good afternoon. So next, uh, what I am going to present is congenital eyelid anomalies. Again, not a very common topic or common presentation you get in uh, your OPDs, but uh, they do present and uh, uh, diagnosing them and giving the treatment uh, to them, which is uh, 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 is of paramount importance. The, for to understand what are those congenital anomalies uh, and to diagnose them and to give them proper uh, classification or nomenclature you need to have understanding of lead anatomy natural history of these anomalies and management options that management options fundamentally depends upon how uh, what type of anomaly it is what is its natural course what is his impact on vision and what is the uh, natural progression as the child uh, increases in age 
so uh, it's not that the child which has presented with some anomaly you try to correct on the first first day first go you uh, find out what is the exact nature and what is its natural course so it requires a physical thorough physical evaluation as well as systemic associations in if any very few can anomalies have do have systemic associations but when they do uh, uh, uh allele anomalies then you need to be aware of them like uh, whether there is any teacher coli syndrome or if there is any uh, golden heart syndrome which you have missed or if the child comes as the discussion was going on of bps uh then uh, the child uh, uh, whether there is a familial history or not as a, a photo as a sir uh, menon sir show and in such case you have to see what are the other uh, hypogonadism hai ki nahi then is there going to be chances of uh, uh, what is called infertility in such uh, children that needs to be kept in mind and uh, told to the parents genetic counseling can be done if it is uh, available and if that uh, this is like bps is there so to what are the anomalies you need to know how the eyelid develops the upper lid and the lower lid they do develop separately the upper lid has a uh, medial and lateral frontonasal process so there is a frontal nasal process um, uh, which is under lateral frontal nasal process the two processes which forms the upper lid while the lower lid is formed by the single process called maxillary process so that is why when you see the lid notching or the notch defect it's more into the mainly in the upper lid involves the uh, uh, medial and lateral two thirds while the lower lid it is more laterally and so as uh, basically it starts with the process of 7th week and by the 9th week the both lid fuse the, that that fusion is required for the differentiation of lid margin there is a uh, ectodermal cords which uh, migrate into the developing lids which forms the mammary gland sweat gland and cilia so there is a ectoderm and mesodermal tissue which forms the uh, 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 basis for the development of mammary glands and mesenchymal tissue as a tarsus so how it uh, this fuse lids then separate at the 6th months of gestation and that separation is uh, where the lids uh, separation of the lid starts which then uh, complete the develop development of the lid and what is the trigger for the separation it's exactly not known but it is said that the secretion of sebum or keratinization of the lid margin is the trigger for the separation of the lid at 6 months so as as you say this is the development so what are the uh, anomalies there are the anomalies are basically of different lid fold development then there is a, a, a the anomaly for the margin and anomaly for the size so when the lid fold development is called cryptosomas where the globe and deeper tissues are covered by sheet of skin and so that there is a complete and partial uh, cryptosomas there is a partial or complete obstruction of the uh, 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 globe so underlying globe is markedly uh, disfigured or disorganized because the, cover, uh, the as the lid uh, develops that the it is commensurate with the development of the globe so uh, absence of the lid development absence of the uh, formation of the frontal nasal process and uh, Uh, ectodermal tissue and everything that the underlying globe is uh, severely uh, disorganized uh, it can be associated with microblepharon or ablepharon the cryptoblepharon which is completely or there can be a small lid or complete absence of the lid in such cases the there is a lot of pro profound uh, diminution of vision loss of uh, disorganized globe so vision is not there and the treatment is generally not possible or unsuccessful in cases eyelid coloma is what you generally see commonly in the opd where there is a most commonly upper or lower lid upper lid is more common as i said this since there are two processes but when the lower lid coloma you get you need to check for the systemic association or other congenital facial clefts like teacher collins or golden heart because a lower lid coloma which is un uncommon is more commonly associated with a uh, systemic anomalies or basically facial cleft defects and uh, what what are the treatment for such uh, uh, colobomas first uh, you have to see that uh, there is a what is the extent how is the bells phenomenon what is the exposure uh, of the cornea what is the uh, initial treatment is conservative lubricants or bcl or surgical options where the coloboma is then closed Uh, where and again the same uh, rules follow in uh, small defects or direct closure or moderate defect will require cantholysis or tension in the small children the skin is taut and doesn't have that much of a uh, uh, laxity of the older patients 
so even uh, when we say that less than 30 percent but even 20 to 25 percent defect is difficult to close and you may need to have a relaxing incision in children uh, eyelid sharing procedures can uh, 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 eyelid sharing procedures should be avoided because they will cause the occlusion of the visual axis and they can be precursor for the deprivation amblyopia then when you come the lead margin so commonest is epiblepharon which you get in the opds where there is a uh, small fold of the skin of uh, antitussel muscle so there is a lead margin is raised many a times this is the uh, uh, these patients are not been brought for this finding but uh, you when the when the child is uh, bought generally a chubby child or a, a child with an uh, antibungaloid slant this patient will have more of uh, epiblepharon so cilia generally doesn't generally do not touch in the cornea they are basically directed vertically lead margin is uh, normal which is in normal position and uh, uh, basically uh, as the child uh, increases as the uh, uh, cheek fat uh, decreases the uh, eyelid position generally comes to normal or it can require if it is persistent or it is uh, the lid lashes are more uh, inward then you can require a small surgical procedure to excise the uh, excess skin and obliquities this is what the uh, epiblepharon means as you can see the lashes are becoming vertical but they are not like uh, going inside so lid margin is normal then there can be epicanthal folds i will just show we then look at commonest is epicanthal papillary is both upper and lower lids are normal uh, both in upper lid and lower lid so epicanthal papillary is equally distributed tarsal is which uh, goes from the prominently upper lid inversus which is commonly associated with the bps syndrome is prominent in lower lid and there can be a epicanthal superciliaris which goes from the eyebrow to lacrimal sac uh, epicanthal folds ca can patient can be brought to the uh, clinic with the pseudo isotropia where the, we can need to check the ocular movements and uh, confirm whether it is a iso or it is a pseudo isotropia treatment uh, we can uh, uh, delay uh, as the child uh, uh, the facial uh, uh, features develop then if the epicanthal fold is uh, too troublesome then we can go for the treatment like uh, uh, surgical correction where the yv plastic or it can be even z plastic double z pl uh, plastic can be uh, attempted there can be then uh, uh, uribeflon uh, uh, and uh, congenital entropion which will be there so what is ankyloblepharon where there is a partial or complete obstruction of the lids that is a web of skin and uh, generally it is uh, commonly uh, at you know, the lateral canthus there can be a small occlusion or there can be a, a vertical uh, tissue bands called as filiforme adentum which needs to be observed uh, which needs to be uh, seen and a simple excision uh, is uh, done uribeflon where the horizontal widening of the palpable fissure there is a horizontal increase in uh, length as opposed to the uh, shortening as seen in bps uh, it's not a, a common but otherwise uh, to be treated conservatively and surgical reconstruction if required then the lateral canthal repositioning entropion and ectropion congenitally are uh, seen rarely entropion is more common than ectropion but when uh, entropion is uh, rarer than ectropion, when the entropion is seen as, uh, as we said, it has to be differentiated from the uh, epiblepharon, where the lead position of the lead margin is uh, more important as uh, uh, compared to epiblepharon, where the direction of cilia is towards the globe in entropion and causing the uh, touch, uh, corneal abrasion. So, if uh, there is a, a damage to the underlying cornea, abrasions or uh, corneal ulcer, then that needs to be treated uh, urgently or otherwise uh, 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 lubricating drop and surgical oil hot stripe procedure where there is a, a removal of the strip of skin uh, orbicularis and giving a uh, everting suture where the suture passes to the lower end of the tarsus to evert the lead margin. Congenital ectropion is uh, uh, obviously uh, is generally seen in lower lids can be associated with VPS or more commonly by the skin condition like ichthyosis there is a goal of treatment is to basically again to see what is the uh, uh, cornea and uh, uh, status of conjunctiva 
lubrication and uh, giving the uh, 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 copious lubricating drops is the initial treatment of choice. And if there is a severe form, uh, like even in the BPS type 2, you need to go for the skin graft. Commonest in what we see uh, and which is a striking as uh, Sir also showed the picture is the BPS syndrome where the blepharophimus is ptosis epicanthus inversus syndrome where there is a as there is a phimosis that is a shortening of the horizontal uh, palpebral fissure along with the ptosis epicanthus inversus and there can be a uh, ectropion of the lateral lower lower lid on the lateral aspect. Uh, 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 type 1 and type 2, where the type 1 is basically associated with premature ovarian failure, that is what we have to keep in mind, and type 2 is uh, associated more commonly with the lower lid ectropion. The type 3 is also described uh, with type 2 and associated with hypertelorism. But generally, what we uh, see in OPD is type 1 and type 2. Uh, the patient needs and family needs to be told about uh, not only the uh, surgical and a, a, a surgical procedure, but also the uh, 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 girls, girl children, if the uh, future of female infertility should be sure. What is the timing of surgery? Generally, at the age of uh, one, one, one and a half to two years. What I, we generally or I have operated at the age of about two to three years only, where there is a early correction of in. Uh, I have done in two stages. First is uh, correction of the. Uh, 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 medial canthus where the YB plasty is easiest or double jet plasty or called as flying man technique followed by uh, uh, treatment for the ptosis. I will just uh, show uh, uh, that as I was saying that uh, coloboma repair when the, it, uh, it is with the lower lid you need to uh, show that it is with the uh, uh, associated why it is not going. So, the low lid colobomas, uh, this is associated with the uh, fa facial cleft and uh, that is why uh, you see it is more on the uh, lateral side. Uh, correction, if it is more than 20 to 30 percent, we can go for uh, uh, direct closure, but it, in this case it was slightly more, medial end was correct, uh, uh, identified and with that uh, tensile semicircular flap, we uh, uh, close the gap uh, by uh, freshening the lid margin, uh, relaxing incision and then uh, I will just fast forward it uh, by correcting and the uh, tensile semicircular flap was fashioned and that was that gave the uh, uh, lid margin to move and close, cover the gap. Uh, tensile was closed in a, a standard manner. Medial, what I was to do, uh, show that when we are uh, getting the medial uh, anchorage type of suture, we had to check uh, where to, because you can't go just go through the skin, there was a stump of, at the medial canthal region which is then uh, utilized to hold the uh, uh, lid closing suture. The lateral canthal, new canthus is formed. The tensile is uh, closed in a standard fashion and then uh, you get a, a good uh, lid uh, closure defect uh, in such cases. Thank you. Now our next speaker is Dr. Onir Bhan. anyway the patient was non-seeing so i thought maybe but after a while obviously because it was stretched so much it broke now i have an option of taking a graft and doing an amniotic it is a, again uh, what uh, though it's a difficult case what you have described and i have not op operated such case but what i will uh, suggest that rather than giving a uh, 
uh, it is what, what is called as along with the plastic surgeon what what the what is they called as uh, sliding graft where the uh, skin is slided over the lid area to form the cover we cannot have the graft or uh, you cannot have a separate uh, like what we generally do as a pre auricular or post auricular graft or direct graft there has to be a sliding graft from the surrounding skin to uh, like the forehead to be uh, covered at the lid lid area uh, not the ch child one case a uh, few or many years back i had operated when i was uh, so there was a four months that's why i'm saying that this in small child has to be some sliding graft uh, because it will be difficult to put any free graft or even the uh, uh, sharing lead sharing procedure what i was saying that one case that was done in our center a few years back where there was a last famous cell carcinoma and the nearly complete loss of upper lid we had to uh, take in the services of the plastic surgeon where he again did the sliding graft to cover the defect they don't have that uh, thinking of having that thinness of the lid that thinking is not for them but they do a great job of covering such a large defect <laughs> glabellar flap you can drink glabellar flap yes Just it. No, no, it's fine. No. <laughs> I'll probably have to speak less. Me and then it's joint, right? Mirpaat joint, right? Because Himika is not here. You are. Next. After that, you are. Okay, 331. Um, before we start, uh, may I request Dr. Raghuraj Higade to come forwards? I mean, you would have more experience than I have in the topic that we are going to talk about today. Okay. So... Rakuraj, please come forward. I, I'll probably get more courage seeing you in front. Okay, so uh, we see a lot of fractures. We see adult fractures. We also see a few pediatric fractures. Now, how are pediatric fractures different? Let's see if I can bring it out. So, first thing is, we will be talking about certain products. But uh, please, I do not have any financial interest in any of them. Or in the surgeries that we're going to be talking about. First thing is, how is pediatric orbital anatomy different from adults? Now, if you look at these two cross sections, you would see that the face actually looks quite different. Okay, so this is an adult face. This is a pediatric face. And uh, children have a large cranial cavity, a large skull, but a very small face when they are born. And around five years, the face starts to develop further until you attain this adult situation where you have this ratio okay the upper part of your face the mid face and the lower face having somewhat similar ratios uh why is this so so the sinuses develop differently you start with the maxillary sinus they're hardly present at birth they develop a little up to the age of three years and then they stop developing but after seven years they start developing again and the unerupted teeth from the especially the molars in the upper jaw are actually occupying that space that is one the second is because the cranium is much larger these children actually present with cranial fractures or roof fractures in the first five years of their lives okay five to seven years and then once the maxilla starts developing at seven is when the forces are redirected and you get more of fractures of the floor of the orbit okay so you have different kinds of fractures you can have fractures which blow out because of raised orbital pressure okay because children have a more prominent frontal process they get more injuries in this area but once your cheeks develop is when you would have fractures involving the mid face 
you could have fractures with combined with uh, fractures of the cranial bones or with other facial bones as well now when you talk about the roof fracture you sometimes get a fracture which is coming in so it's a blow in fracture you can have herniation of meninges you can have herniation of brain tissue into the orbit as well okay orbital fractures typically blow out but this is what you would generally see in an adult okay a large fracture you can see the fat herniating in and dragging the medial inferior rectus down okay what do we generally see in an orbital fracture you see swelling you see chymosis you get motility disorders you can have diplopia and of course you can have globe as well as optic nerve injuries and these are also important for us to detect and on the systemic side you could have head injuries which would take precedence you could have injuries of the orbit and of the thorax and the abdomen which again would take precedence over meningeal orbital fracture now this is typically this picture typically shows what happens in a adult okay what is different again we talked about the anatomical uh, aspects the other is the children have soft elastic bones okay unlike the brittle bones that adults have so here what happens is you get a uh, the initial impact you get a crack a linear fracture some orbital content may go into the maxillary sinus and then get entrapped there so it closes okay it snaps back and the problem here is unlike in the adult where we showed a larger fracture you have the risk of ischemic necrosis to the structures entrapped especially if it is the inferior rectus muscle okay this is what a typical pediatric fracture would look like okay they usually do not have the kind of hemorrhages or the ecchymosis that you see in an adult they usually do not have crepitation where because you know air escaping into the orbit these are things you don't see in a child you would see a child with a white eye the main problem is the motility restriction they might complain of, they usually complain of pain but the other big symptom is because of the ocular cardiac reflex so they would have nausea they would have vomiting they would have bradycardia and often they are misdiagnosed to have either these problems because of a head injury or because of an acute abdomen so sometimes they are wrongly diagnosed and treated in that line before they actually end up with an ophthalmologist what our other colleagues often miss is the eye movement problems because children are are not very cooperative that's their nature right so this is what would happen in a pediatric fracture a smaller fracture with a prolapse this is one boy we we call him karate kid so he was very good in his class and uh, he sustained an injury during one of these mock fights and see this is what happens look at his right eye look at his left eye there is just no movement and you can see a part of his inferior rectus muscle prolapsed and it is pinched in by the flow which is come back up right you would also find that there would be some restriction in down gaze as well and this child was again presented two weeks later where this is actually a medical emergency this is a surgical emergency you would like to operate on these children in the first 24 to 48 hours you do not want that injured uh, that ischemic necrosis to happen to the inferior rectus muscle so that's another patient here this is that uh, boys uh, scan this is what happens in a typical adult okay so what do you look for you look for the motility restriction you get ct scans done and you do a positive force duction test now this is difficult in children in an older cooperative child you can do a positive uh, of uh, sorry a force duction test but in a smaller child you can do this under eua under general anesthesia okay take them as soon as possible check for the force uh, duction test because some of these children might have a fracture without any entrapment and those are the children who do not need any surgery at all okay uh so these are things to, to watch out number one is the ocular cardiac reflex is there a hemorrhage behind the eye okay are we dealing with an open globe injury because that would need treatment first you would actually avoid doing a fracture surgery in such a situation because you could actually rupture the globe or cause further injury in a situation like that because of the manipulation involved in orbital surgery csf leak okay and of course muscle strangulation so how do we uh, manage fractures first thing is you expose the floor so you do a swinging eyelid incision go into the floor the important thing is to release the entrapped tissue and there's the muscle or the fat or both and then you have to cover the uh, that floor so in a child you actually need to increase the size of the fracture so you have a thin hairline fracture you have to increase the size of the fracture we use bone punches for that 
so that you can release the uh, trapped contents, bring it back into the orbit, and then you have to cover it. You do not reduce fractures in this situation, right? You just cover it with an implant. Repeat the forced action test to ensure that you've released the tissues, and then you close the incision. We will skip this. So basically, the, there are different kinds of implants. Cranium axillofacial surgeons will generally use autologous bone. We are more comfortable using material like this. So you can use a silicon sheet or porous polyethylene. Or in larger fractures, you might use a titanium mesh. But in children, this titanium mesh is something that we would not recommend. Okay, you can have composite materials. Again, we'll skip this. But uh, these are newer implants that have come. They are resorbable and they are preferable in pediatric fractures. The last three here are available in India. This is fairly affordable, but the other two are pretty... These are uh, preformed orbital plates, which are quite expensive. Even the screws that come with them are absorbable screws. Okay, so my last slide. So this is that same karate kid. You can see that his after his uh, surgery, he is able to look up, but then he still continues to have a little bit of diplopia. Remember this patient presented two weeks after his trauma. Okay, so he still has a little bit of diplopia in up gaze, but what is very important to us is he does not have diplopia in primary gaze or in down gaze. Okay. Most recently, we have operated on a child three weeks after presentation. Again, the child was admitted with a head injury, apparent head injury. And that is where time was lost. And you see what happens is when this muscle is pinched in, this ischemic necrosis would either cause weakness of the muscle or even cause fibrosis of the muscle. So they would continue to have some residual problems, either in up gaze or in down gaze or both. So very important. Number one is beware of entrapment because that is something that we all need to watch out for. Hopefully most ophthalmologists would pick it up. Often uh, the emergency care uh, people miss this sign and which is why we as ophthalmologists need to keep talking to them about it. White out uh, blowout fractures is important because you know, since the surface looks pretty quiet, they're often missed out. And we just talked about orbital implants, they're silicon implants, porous polyethylene is easily available. And if these, uh, once these become affordable, yes, this would be the preferred material to use. That's all, thank you. Any questions? Anirvan, in which type of cases? Yeah, generally land up with a ischemic, ischemia of that muscle, which type of, from, from MRI or so, so, sorry, from CT scan, how mm. can we the, understand that this muscle is vulnerable for ischemic sickness? Uh, first thing is that um, when we see fracture, we generally don't ask for MRIs. Okay, so it's a CT scan that we ask for and in a CT scan, it's difficult to tell whether the muscle has already become ischemic. But if you see a trapdoor fracture, yes, that is the situation where you would generally be de dealing with a situation where the muscle would potentially be injured or would be ischemic. Okay, but MRI is something that we really don't ask for in a fracture yes, situation. It will anyways. be difficult for mm -hmm. a radiologist also to tell by from the CT scan. Most of the time, this is we are facing. So it is uh, the amount of ischemia, etc., is of course impossible except few. So next option is, as part of book standard, if there is a no diplopia, no enough thalmos, you should not touch. No, That's a me medical legal point. So something happened in GA that now a one child norm, very difficult for us to protect us. So in such scenario, to go for a early orbital surgery, reconstructive surgery, what, what will be your take home message to us or to the audience? Okay, John, let me put it this way. Number one is, are we dealing with an entrapment? Okay, it's something we have to be very clear about. So you see a movement abnormality and let's, let's uh, take an example. Let's take a child who is about six years old. Hmm. You, the child has a motility disturbance. The scan shows that there is a fracture. The scan also shows that there is prolapsed content in the orbit. And what we expect at this age is that there would be a very small fracture. So one has to be very careful looking for the fracture because you can often miss the fracture as well. The next thing is you're taking the movements, which is uh, important. What if there is no entrapment? So you need to confirm that. If it's a small child like uh, five or seven year old that we're talking about, 
there is no harm in taking the child for EUA because you would probably avoid an unnecessary surgery in a situation like that. Yes. Right. And then uh, everything has to be done with the consent of the parents, of course. They have to be explained the situation that if this fracture is not treated, what are we going to end up with? I'm sure as sensible parents, they would agree. Definitely. You want to say something? Come Just uh, one comment. Now, another thing yeah. is that, uh, uh, especially for the uh, diplopia, it doesn't necessarily, uh, especially these green stick fractures, mm. uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a muscle entrapment to have diplopia. Especially in older children, they actually come back with, you're not seeing anything on the CT scan, but they keep saying that uh, they're seeing double, uh, extra movement seems normal. Uh, even you do a, a nine gaze cardinal test, nothing, uh, you can't even make out. But the, pay, the child keeps on complaining. Okay. Then, uh, when on, uh, then you uh, go in, uh, even you repeat the test all, repeat the CT scan also, you can't see that uh, fracture. Usually, the intramuscular septa, if it gets trapped, Intra that will cause, that will cause diplopia in itself. Yeah. So, I have at least two pediatric cases, little older children who are able to uh, describe diplopia. So, there it's just a small, so on, on table, you will see that there is a entrapment right there and just have to release it. In those cases, we don't even need to put a barrier implant also. You can just, just, leave, just, leave, it, leave, it, just leave it alone. Simple uh, So that one. And uh, now with the, uh, the regarding the pediatric uh, fractures, the uh, bioresolvables, uh, these uh, implants are actually, sh uh, can shape it. It's a thermal labile uh, thing. So you can shape it. You can use a template of the, uh, the oh, titanium implant. Mm -hmm. and use it uh, and uh, heat it up in a, a water bath and shape it according to that thing and you just put the uh, bioresorbable implant in. So even you can do that even with osteopore as well as resolve. So mm -hmm. you don't really have to use a titanium implant even for a uh, child. child. And definitely screw is, screwing is in the pediatric as well, not a so easy task. Uh, it's not Sometimes, easy and sorry. not recommended also because yes. it can cause Lot of, uh, late no, until, yes. until the resolvable implants came, the yes, option yes. was actually to remove the implants after six months. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And I think that in near future, the resolvable uh, the implant will be the another option okay. for us Our in order to uh, We have done uh, after two years, three years, actually the, there is real bone formation. Yes, and you yes. can't even see the implant. It's just yeah. real, it, as if it, there was no fracture at all. After two years and, and and even bone also grows very faster in younger age group that's another person if you can release if it is no entrapment you can just uh, observe it so in a, you don't even need to use a screw to fix it you mm -hmm. can just use synaclate glue there and fix yes. it so that's enough for the to uh, uh, stay in place mm -hmm. and uh, anyway if you're using a bigger implant it, you'll have to put it in the posterior edge so you don't need to use a screw to, to <coughs> eliminate having a screw at all even because the screw itself is the more more expensive one than the implant because you can use you can use it for two patients the uh, osteopore or the, even the big sheets yeah. you can use it for two patients but you can the screws are multiple so each one of them costs i think around four or five thousand a uh, screw so it's not uh, so if you eliminate the screw call it itself thank you thank you sorry like most of these there will be a lot of uh, patients coming as in the pediatric age group. Other than green streak fractures, many of them present late only. And they would have extensive injuries, extensive fractures, which possibly would not be, be fixed up with Medpore. So we have to go in and buy absorbable. Uh, they're very expensive. So there is something midway between. So we are using titanium. So you recommend that you just said to avoid. So, a year, usually wait for a year before we remove it. Uh, even though uh, it says that six, six months, but six months sometimes it's not enough. Uh, fibrosis uh, occurs within that. So you might have, especially if there's multiple complex fractures uh, in a pediatric age group, it do, it, even though kids heal fast, it sometimes they don't heal fast enough. So just so that you don't have to uh, do a second, you wait for a year. Usually, the ones with the complex are a little older children. Uh, very young, very small children, very rarely we get uh, very complex fractures. Uh, the bigger children, maybe more than five and uh, more than five years or more than 10 years old, they usually uh, these are the ones which we which will have complex fractures. Very small children, they may not survive the accident uh, to 
actually have come and uh, if a complex fracture occurs in a very small child, they may not even survive the accident. So, uh, uh, very, uh, very, uh, I, I've, ne I've never had a child less than five years old, multiple, multiple injuries which we were able to, because they don't land up in the hospital at all. They may not survive that kind of an injury. No, usually even after the this thing, there is a all the fat. Uh, this thing is also uh, the fat cover also after till up to fourteen years of age, the malar development still goes on. So especially if you have any plates on the malar uh, area, uh, that you need to remove. The mesh uh, mesh is not that much of a problem. It's just if it's just the mesh, we can just keep it. We don't even need to remove it. Uh -huh. So the the problem is where you ha if you have plates on the uh, this thing, uh, plates on the malar, malar region uh, and on the brow. So these areas actually, uh, even they continue to grow, even up till 20-25 uh, uh, years of age, they continue to grow, the brow, the uh, malar areas and all that. Uh, not very uh, fast, but they slowly, slowly they keep growing up till 20-25 years of age. So better to remove them in a younger child. Uh, if it's older, more than 18, I think uh, we can just leave it. Yeah, yeah, I'll just finish up it at the earliest. So that's another challenging condition is proptosis in children. Of course, there is a evaluation it should be very, very proper from general examination from that pulse BP temperature, it will start all. Then only we can just uh, think for it. If suppose it's a benign lesion, is nothing to worry. But in sometimes they are may be very very difficult. So broadly, it may be inflammatory neoplastic, or it may be associated with some syst systemic disorder also. Uh, pediatric malignancy, of course, is to to two percent of that contribution in total childhood malignancies, and one very very we generally overlook it is in leukemic. In leukemia condition, it in our country, the orbital inflammation of apoptosis is one of the common. So in such cases, we can look. The, sometimes the pediatrician also treating the patient in a uh, several times of antibiotic, antibiotic, antibiotic. They are overlooked due to the very high. They are examining very high number of patients. So I found lots of patients in my uh, that uh, uh, career. So they are ultimately leukemia. It was not detected by pediatrician. It was detected by ophthalmologist. Unfortunate in our country. <laughs> Pediatric orbital malignant tumor, of course, is a is a rare in children, but we cannot uh, that thing. One is rhabdoma sarcoma is one of the commonest. So first of all, the first approach is the um, uh, challenges are worry of the parents. With the one kid, there may be a uh, two parents, one grandmother, two grandmothers, a huge crowd always. So that to tackle first is a, a diplomatic way we can tackle because now it is very very difficult for everyone is very much um, aggressive also. Examination difficulties of course so that is one and from the other hand the parents another they will that they will not allow you in, in a proper way proper position. Uh, origin of the lesion it will be very very difficult they are not, that because is a not a direct one in case of a four year five year they cannot say anything so we can rely on the parents on the history so those are the some problems some rare presentation i want to see this is one of my patients earlier he is just like a treated for fever etc temperature just like there was a probably that is a sty and it is orbital involvement there is a orbital abscess so they are someone they are diagnosing retinoblastoma someone diagnosed rhabdomyo sarcoma but once i examine full examination that's why i mentioned is total detail examination a to z so i examined then there was a some uh, brvo uh, brvo crvo like hemi crvo like a picture then i thought it may be a, some sudden pressure in the orbit so advice for initially for one ct scan so there's an interesting that the gas bubble was found they understand that there may be some organism which is very very virulent so there's gas forming organism so immediately child was taken care in the ultrasound guided in our hospital itself ultrasound guided and 
the advantage of this is this we can see and in the under in us, uh, almost in its under sedation we can aspirate it so this is the method of ultrasound guided but uh, by simple technique by um, cannula even with that we can insert the cannula we can fix it and because that or we don't know the organism it may again that pocket may again accumulate with the fluid etc so we are that is a take home message for all these things is that we can send that for culture sensitivity in the meantime there is a free patency yes one minute okay i will cover it all so those are the patients and this is a follow-up and it's over the common malignant tumor as i'm not going for theoretical point those are the pictures in our country so though retinoblastoma is ocular but most of the time we may first ophthalmologist may be the first presenting um, that, that one in a that case so that is of course with that help of now is very very easier the abdomen sarcoma again i am mentioning so in such cases sometimes you may go for a that now it is take home message for the abdomen sarcoma is you can debulking as much as possible go for a camo no need for exenteration this patient is a refractory it has failed for camo radio and then we can go for a exenteration but still that with exenteration also we fail because of this distant metastasis in the system etc so we can look all in any cases of proptosis child ct scan abc peripheral blood smear all leukemic that's why i already mentioned this patient was rhabdomyo um, sarcoma it was someone just a biopsy was done again there is a recurrence so i did the maximum resection and then now he is doing well we should examine the lymph node there may be some he was treated by some other places and as biopsy also taken from the neck by some uh, rural hospital but it was a case of lymphoma without biopsy they thought it is a some amount of lump or some abscess they just they did the thing one important is that leukemia has almost mentioned in our country proptosis or that may be one of the cause for leukemia very unfortunate condition so we can go for all big lesion so if we examine on the table then there is a lump over the kidney so then we can detect by we can save that sign we can send back to the immediately if there is an ultrasound also it's confirmed or clinical diagnosis so it is a neuroblastoma so histiocytosis is one of the rare tumors is one of the published in ICO one my case uh, that one we can just scrub it out and then we can go for chemo and then after chemo is fine so those are the points and sometimes that may be b9 tumor also that we are lucky then if that patient's also lucky that it is though it looks bigger but we can remove it but sometimes if it is a leukemic deposits very very already is too late in leukemic uh, disorders so most of the time if you look that here it is already intracranial involvement is there in such cases and care for infant definitely that always to anesthesiologist my take home for all infant less than one year if i do any procedure there is always to anesthesiologist and that uh, that is a well equipped that monitor everything and that is uh, even that a pulse oximeter also different kind of that hospital have that that it is not a work the simple pulse oximeter will not work and in the ward also that with this facility should be there to monitor the patient for any kind of pediatric cases that we that our take home message we can take care of most than any adult population thank you Actually, we are already running behind us. Little, if any questions, then shortly I can just take one or two questions. Otherwise, any comments so, from uh, speaker? Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Already, our next sessions are already waiting. Yes, yes. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Ramesh Murthy, it was very difficult to uh, fill in his place. I thank everyone and all the panelists. Thanks.